Good morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ Wednesday Holy Spirit Study. We're on page 75 in your little booklet that I handed out to you. We're going to get ready to get started, and as we do that, let's have ourselves a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we just praise you and thank you for every blessing you give us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit, not just in preserving your word, but in, in our lives and in our, our very existence. Uh, we pray, Father, that as we have studied and as we have been looking at your word, that you help us to uh, receive from your Holy Spirit everything that you intend for us to receive. But we also ask, Father, that you help us not to be expecting things that you have not said that, we're, that we are to receive, no matter how the world views things. We ask that you would look down upon us and bless us as we study, pray your Holy Spirit would be with us, and that your Holy Spirit would enlighten, enlighten us to understand your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we are on page 75, and as we're looking at page 75 on your notes, we're dealing with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and we're trying to figure out exactly what that means as we speak about the idea of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Last week, we spent some time talking about the, the uh, time when the, when the miraculous gifts were going to cease. That doesn't mean God can't, can't allow people to do miracles. God can do whatever he wants. But we were talking about the specific gifts that were given by the laying on of the apostles' hands and that were bestowed by the Holy Spirit and the, the Father and Jesus and the purpose for them. We notice that the purpose for them, uh, as, as, in the, as is the work of the Holy Spirit, was to be able to give proof that the... Uh, words that are being preached, whether written or whether oral, were from God. And therefore, God had the Holy Spirit not only inspire the writers, but also had them do various miraculous gifts for the purpose of validating whether it was oral or in the written word that the message that we have comes from God. And that's the reason why in our scriptures we... Uh, or why the scriptures to us are so important, because we understand that they are God's word that were given to us so that we can understand his will. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit is to reveal God's will. So we have then also looked at the idea of the word in. And, oh, I know. It's in your booklet is page 73 or 74. It, it's, it's the part that says... Um, the word dwells as used in the New Testament scriptures. Okay, oh, yeah, 73. All right, so you're in 73. Because remember, I gave you those other sheets that, you know, go in there, and so mine has them already in order. Yours doesn't. Uh, but anyway, so your page is 73, I think, and uh, my page is 75. Okay, so uh, uh, we also looked at the idea of the word in, where it talked about God being in you, you being in God, the Father being in you, the Father being in Jesus, Jesus being in the Father. And we pointed out that what that represents is the idea of unity. It represents the idea of unity, not necessarily geography. In other words, it's, it's a, it, the word in is, is used in a relational or relationally rather than geographically. And so we also use that terminology in our uh, culture. We don't use it a lot, but somebody says, I was really into that movie. Okay. The, the idea of him being into the movie doesn't mean that he was actually in the movie, but it meant that the movie was uh, affecting him and that he was involved in the movie as it was going on. And so therefore he was engrossed in it. And so that's used relationally, not geographically. Uh, and so as we looked at the word in, we notice that where it talks about God being in us and Jesus being in us and the Holy Spirit being uh, in us doesn't necessarily have to be geographically, but it's referring to it relationally. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that God can't grant us certain powers or abilities, uh, but I think there's a difference between God granting us certain abilities and powers and God actually being, or Jesus or the Holy Spirit actually being in you in, in a geographical way. And so we covered that last week. Today, what we're going to look at is the idea of the word dwell, and uh, we're going to talk about the, the, uh, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit and the dwelling of God as we take a look at this, and hopefully we'll be able to learn some things about how the Holy Spirit dwells in us. So, uh, in, I think we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, I think, on your paper there, right under where it says uh, dwell, 
And it says, read the following verses and write down who dwells in, in whom or where and if it says how. And so that's that's our job as we as we were reading these together. So let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. And it says this. It says, or, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And so there's the idea of dwell. So uh, the, the question is, what dwells in what or how or uh, who, you might say. So who dwells where? Okay, so, so God dwells in us, right? Okay, and he compares it to what? What's the example? A temple. All right, so he, he compares it to a temple. So, so keep that in mind because we're going to come back to it in just a minute. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17 says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you being rooted and grounded uh, in love. All right, so, so Christ dwells in us, right? All right, that's how Christ dwells in us. All right, now, Colossians 1 and 19. And like I said, we'll be coming back to these and making application to them. I just want to read them right now. 19 says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. What's dwelling in whom? All right, so the fullness dwells in him, and the him is Jesus. So in Jesus dwells the fullness of God. Um, Colossians 3 and verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. What dwells in what? So the word of Christ richly dwells within you, right? It's the word of God, that, the word of Christ that dwells within you. All right, uh, Colossians 3, I don't know, we just did that one, uh, James 4, 5. James 4 and verse 5, it says, uh, Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit uh, which he has made to dwell in us. So the Spirit dwells in us, right? All right, Revelation 2, 13. Revelation 2 and verse 13 and it says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. So who's doing the dwelling here? Okay, Satan dwells, but also where you dwell. So, so it's where you dwell, and it says it's where Satan dwells. Okay? Like I said, we'll come back and look at these in just a minute. So it says the word dwell, as used in the previous verses, is used geographically or relationally? Okay, used relationally, basically. You might think, well, some of them sound like they're, they're geographically, but let's go back and let's notice exactly what these are talking about as we do that. So we have 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16. If you remember, here's what it said. It says, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, the contrast here is between two things. There is the 
the temple of idols and the temple of God. And he says, what agreement do these have with each other? What agreement do idols and God have with each other? They're not supposed to have any, right? And so when he says, you are the temple, what he's talking about is who do you let rule your life? If you let the idols rule your life, then you are what? You're not God's temple. If you let God rule your life, then you are what? You are God's temple. So the idea here is the agreement. It's the agreement that's under consideration. It's the agreement. Are you, if you're a temple of God, then you should agree to manifest what? God. Now, if you're a temple of, of idols, what are you going to let manifest in your life? Idols. idols. You're going to agree with idols. So the idea of dwelling here has to do with agreement. That's what it has to do with. Because he then says uh, in verse 16, For we are the temple of the living God, just as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. So here you have uh, dwell in them and walk among them. And, and those are parallel. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. There you have the agreement. So God says, I'm going to make you my people, and, you're, and I'm going to be your God. So we're going to have agreement together. So I'll be able to walk in you, and I'll be able to walk among you. And the idea of walking in you and walking among you, or dwelling among you, is the same thing. And so it's not necessarily speaking about geographically, although we are talking about the spiritual world or the spiritual realm. Uh, and... Uh, we need to kind of consider that, but he's talking about this idea of agreement. Who do you agree with? Now, if you go to Ephesians, uh, any question on that one? Ephesians 3.17. Go to Ephesians 3.17, and he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So here you have Christ, and here he's going to dwell in you. And how does God dwell? How does Jesus dwell in you? So you have Christ. And how is he going to dwell in you? Through faith. Through faith. Now, how does faith come? Hearing. By hearing in, hearing by the word of God. So he's going, to, he's going to dwell in you by faith. If you believe him, if you trust him, if you follow him, then he is dwelling in you. That's the same thing as agreement with the temple. You either agree with God or you agree with the idols. You either put your faith in Christ or you put your faith in idols or something else. And so you, you have that same uh, idea that's there. Now, if you look at the previous verse, uh, which is verse um, 16, because we're, we picked up verse 17 in, a, in the middle of a sentence, verse 16 says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So God wants you filled up with his character, and his character is love, and the way that you, that you can get there is by the work of the Spirit. So the Spirit is going to do that, is going to do that for you. That's, that's the function of the Spirit. We, we talked last week about the idea that, that, uh, that the information you have is what strengthens you to do whatever it is that you're going to do. Uh, if you think you can lift 100 pounds, you're going you're gonna to lift 100 pounds. If you think you can't, you're not going to. So what empowers you is, is your, your information or the ability that you have or what you know, and that's the way God dwells in you by faith, and what he wants to get in you is love. So you're going to be empowered to love because the Spirit has told us about Jesus and God's Word and how Christ loved us, and so therefore we're going to go out into the world and we're going to love people. So it, it empowers us to love as, as God would love. All right. 
Any thoughts on that? Colossians 1 then, in verse 19. Colossians 1, 19. Now here it says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. Now this is talking about the, the Father and Jesus. And it says it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in, in him. Right? Uh, and so it sounds like the, the Father... Um, is dwelling in G in Jesus, uh, and I certainly wouldn't disagree with that. But really, what he's what he's saying here, when he says, "For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him," what he's saying is, is God created His Son, and when when we create our Son, what are we putting in them? Us. We're putting us in them. We we hope they look like us and not the mailman, right? They look like the mailman, then you know somebody else puts something in them. Unless you're married to a mailman, in which case it's okay. Yeah, in which case, in your case, if you look like the milkman, you'd be in trouble. Uh, so uh, when he says here that uh, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, Jesus was going to be like His Father because His Father was was deity, and so in Jesus is going to be deity. And it was the Father's good pleasure to create his son or to, you know, I realize Jesus was, was uh, preexistent, but to create this individual on earth that would have the fullness of deity, that would have the fullness of God in him because he, he is God. And so uh, that's how, that's kind of how that's being used there. Yes. In my Bible, the word Father Right. Right. Mm -hmm. How would that have worked in the original text? For it was it was the good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. So you, you'd have to supply the who, whoever it is, and the context is talking about uh, what God has done with Jesus. God made him head. Because you know, when you're looking at Jesus, you're looking at the man Jesus. And so the father is the one who governs man. And so the father is the one who does all this for man or to man or with man, however you want to think about that. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. All right, good. Uh, that doesn't mean it's right. It just means maybe it's helpful. Uh, Colossians 3.16 says, uh, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, or richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart. So, in this one, it's the word of Christ that dwells in you. As the word of Christ dwells in, in you, what's your activity? <coughs> well, what's your activity in this verse as the, as the word dwells in you? you admonish one another. Okay, you admonish. Admonish, you sing, right? Uh, he says... Uh, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom. So, so you have wisdom, teaches you to admonish one another with songs and hymns and spiritual songs. So when you do... Giving with gratitude. That's right, and with no. gratitude and thanks. You give thanks. Okay, now, if these are in you, it's, if you're doing these things, it's because something is in you. What's in you? The word of Christ. That's what's dwelling in you if you do these things. Now, if, if you're not a, a wise person, it's because why? You're not listening to God. Like some of our leaders today, they're not very wise in making all these, trying to make all these decisions about gender and trying to do all this stuff that they're teaching about abortion and all that. They're not making wise decisions. They're, they're not being wise. Well, why, why aren't they wise? Because Christ, Christ isn't in them. And by the way, if you have wisdom, admonish one another, you sing, and your thankfulness, that's a demonstration of love. And so it's, uh, all, all of that is based on the fact that the word of Christ richly dwells within you. And that also would then include how you're the temple of God. The temple of God is supposed to show the character of God. It's not supposed to show the character of idols. It's supposed to show the character of God. Uh, all right, so anything on that? 
All right, James chapter uh, 4 and verse 5, as we looked at that one, James 4 and verse 5 says, um, Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Now, uh, a couple of things to look at in this verse. First of all, when he says, uh, which he has made, he's not saying he made the Spirit. He's saying he's made the Spirit to do something. So that's the first thing I want you to understand. He's not saying God made the Spirit to dwell in you. He's saying the Spirit is how God's going to dwell in you. That's what he made the Spirit do. So uh, I only say that because sometimes people get a little confused there because you can kind of read it in two different ways. And so he says, uh, he jealously desires the Spirit which he has made to dwell in us. God wants us to have this character, this kind of character here, that comes from the Spirit. That's, that's, what God, that's what God is jealous about. God wants you to, to manifest the character of the Spirit, and that's what he wants to dwell in us. So the Spirit dwells in us. Well, he already showed us how the Spirit dwells in us. Uh, when we have the words of Christ, then we're going to love that was given to us by the, by the Spirit, according to Ephesians chapter 3. And the, since, you're, since you love, you're going to do things like have wisdom, admonish one another, sing, and be thankful. Uh, and this is, this is all going to happen because God desires that spirit to be in you. That's the spirit he desires to be in you. That's, that's the way God wants us to, to act and live. All right, now, uh, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13. Revelation 2.13 Remember, this is a highly figurative book, but nonetheless, he's writing, and he's writing to the church at Pergamos. And he says, I know where you dwell, and that's certainly where they live, where Satan's throne is, and, he, and you hold fast my name and, deny, and have not denied my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So here there's two dwells. There's the physical dwelling, of the people who live in Pergamos, and then there is the dwell where the where the where Satan dwells. Now, when he says where Satan dwells, does that mean that if you want to go see Satan, all you have to do is go to Pergamum, and there you can see him? Is that what that, is that what that means? No. What does it mean? It means the spirit of Satan is in those people. It means those people are doing what Satan would do. That's what it means. Well, if that's what it means for them, and we, we don't expect to go down there and see Satan, why would we expect to see Jesus in somebody if, G, if he does exactly the same thing when he dwells in us? He's talking about our activity. He's talking about how we function and how we move. And so here, where Satan dwells means that Satan rules there. Satan controls them. Well, that's how Jesus... Christ uh, and the Holy Spirit and the Father dwell in us. That's how they can all dwell in us at the exact same time because they're ruling us. They're ruling over us. And if, if we do what they say, then we're letting them rule over us. And therefore, we're dwelling with them. We're, we're doing what they would do. And we would be in agreement. We would be in unity with one another as we dwell with one another. And so uh, Revelation 2 and 13 uh, says that. Now, I, I think I forgot to read Revelation chapter 21. Yeah, and verse 3. See, I'm an old guy. But, but here, we're talking about a picture of the uh, perfected uh, state of the church and of God's people. In, in Revelation 21, 3, he says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God... <laughs> Is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And so here he says that God is going to dwell with them because what's going to be there? This tabernacle. The tabernacle of God will be there. In other words, God says, I'm going to live among you guys. I'm going to be here, and he, and he will dwell among them. 
So if he is our God, does that mean we do what the idols tell us? No, it means we do what God tells us, right? So, so the idea of dwell is not so much, at least in these verses, it's not so much uh, where you are physically residing, but it is what? It's where your spirit dwells, or it's who's controlling you. It's who's moving you, who's motivating you, who's causing you to do what you do. See, the temple of the idols, they do what the idols tell them to do. That's what they do. God's temple does what God wants it, it, uh, them to do. Now, of course, the idea of a temple is a physical building, but he's trying to teach us something spiritually. And, and so the word dwell is used in the previous verse is used Relationally or geographically? Use relationally. And, and it's no different than the word in. Now, that doesn't mean it can't ever be used geographically, but not in the scriptures that we've looked at where God dwells in us and is among us. Okay? All right. So, any questions then on that so far? Yes, sir. Well, I just did, except you have a you have a, a an old version of the Bible. Cause, yeah, because you're an old guy. <laughs> no, but 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 we looked at that verse in James four and verse five. All right, so so let me read it to you in the the more modern, up to date version. Not to say that yours isn't, isn't correct, uh, but here's the way it puts it in James four five, according to the American Standard. It says, and most of the more modern translations translate it this way, uh, uh, 4 5 says, or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously, that's the idea of lusting after, he jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. So the idea of lusting after in, in your version is the idea of being jealous. He's jealous about it. He wants this. This is what he wants in you. He, he, uh, he wants the Spirit to be in you, okay? And if the Spirit's in you, then you're going to walk in love. Your character is going to be that you're wise, you admonish people, you sing, you give thanks to God because you're being God's temple, because you're in agreement with God, you're not in agreement with the idols, because the Spirit has revealed all that to us and made it known to us. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um. Uh, Okay, so then you have next on your paper, uh, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, it, it, there's a note here, and this says teacher supplied. Uh, it says the note on dwell. Uh, the word dwell in the Greek is never used in reference to, uh, to a slave. In other words, a slave never says, if you ask him, where do you dwell? He wouldn't say, oh, I dwell over there where my master lives. He would say, I reside over there. He would say, I live over there. But he wouldn't use the word dwell because dwell implies the idea of control. It implies the idea of rule over. And so a slave wouldn't say, I rule over that property over there. If his, if his master heard him say that, he'd be in trouble. Now, that's not the way we necessarily use it, but that's the way it, it was used in the Greek back then. All right. Now, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit after that, and we want to take a look at that and try to figure out a couple of things. And by the way, I added some more verses in my, in my paper than you have in yours, because I always seem to, to, to do that. Uh, but uh, it, uh, one of the things is, why would we think that the Spirit dwells in us any different than the Father in Jesus? So that's one thing to think about. Why in the world would we think that the Spirit would dwell any different with us? Because you have to remember, is God physical or is God spirit? God's spirit. Is the Father spirit? Yeah. Is, is, the, is the Word spirit? Yeah, he was made flesh, but he's spirit, right? Is the Holy Spirit spirit? Yes. So it doesn't matter what, which, which you know, part of the deity you're talking about. Their spirit is spirit. So if the Spirit dwells in us, 
uh, uh, or, or the, the Jesus dwells in us one way and the Father dwells in us one way, why would we expect the Spirit to dwell in us a different way? They're, they're all the same, right? All right. So uh, we notice that in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17, how was it that, that Jesus dwells in us? In 317, how did he dwell in us? Uh huh. By faith. He dwells in us by faith. Well, if Jesus dwells in us by faith, how do we expect the Father to dwell in us? By faith. How do we expect the Spirit to dwell in us? By faith. Exactly the same way. We wouldn't expect anything different. We'd expect them to dwell exactly the, the same way. And, and if you're looking at Jesus from the standpoint of being a man, there's no way that I, as a man, can physically dwell in you. But I can, if it were talking relationally, I dwell in my children. My, my children act like me, too bad. They, they, they act like me. They, they, some of them even look like me, okay? So that's how I do it in the physical realm. And, and if Christ is dwelling in us, he dwells in us by Faith, and so why would we think the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit dwell differently in us? Now, Romans chapter 8, and down here at verse 9. I don't know if you have this one, but if, you, if, I, if I say one you don't have, just write it down. In, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, he says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So here it says, he's contrasting what? Flesh and spirit, right? So how do you know whether you're, whether you're living in the flesh or living in the spirit? Because I have this physical body. I am in, in, the, in a physical world. I live in a physical world. But God also put within me a spirit. So how do I know how I'm living. He says, however, you are not in the flesh. Well, yes, I am. I'm physically in the flesh. But when he says you're not in the flesh, he's not talking geographically. He's talking relationally. He says we don't deal relationally in the flesh, even though we have a physical fleshly body. He says you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Well, if I'm not in the flesh because I'm not relationally dealing with the flesh, but I'm in the spirit, then I must be dealing relationally with the spirit. I am going to do what the spirit says. I'm not going to do what the flesh says. I'm going to do what the spirit says. And even though I have flesh and even though I have spirit, I'm choosing which one to be in agreement with. And that's why he says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God rules you, dwells in you, lives in you, under whose reign you're, you're, you're falling. You can, either, you can either listen to the flesh or you can listen to the Holy Spirit and you can listen to God. And so he says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So if I don't have the spirit of Christ, then I must be following the flesh. That's the contrast here. If I'm following the flesh, I don't have Christ's spirit in me. I don't have the Holy Spirit in me because I'm not letting the Holy Spirit rule me, control me, or, or guide me. Okay? Uh, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse... Let's start with verse um, 8, 2 Corinthians 12, 8. He says, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might, be, that it might leave me. Now, this is talking about Paul's thorn in the flesh. Uh, so he says, and he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. 
Most gladly, therefore, I will, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So he says he's going to talk about his weaknesses so the power of Christ can dwell in him. What does that mean? Okay, you have the power of God inside you? Right. Okay. What does that have to do with being weak? Mm -hmm. What does that have to do with being weak? Paul says, Paul says, I boast in my weaknesses. He said, I would rather boast in my weaknesses. Okay. So so the idea is if if you're weak then somebody else has to lift you up. Somebody else has to move you. Somebody else has to ca cause you to do what it, whatever it is that you do. And that's why he says here that Christ may dwell in me. So Christ is the one that's going to move him. He's going to listen to what he's going to listen to what Christ says, and it's going to empower him, even though he's weak, because as God is empowering him, people will recognize it's not Paul who did that, but it's Christ who did that. Well, what he says is, uh, he says, most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast in my weaknesses. Because it's strengthening him. God strengthened him at that time, right? Well, well yeah. But the, the, so, so the idea is, is he's weak, and he allows God to do whatever God wants to do with him so that uh, people can see that it's not him that's doing it, but it's, it's God that's doing it. Working in him. Right. That God's working in him, yes. Now you're saying I'm old. Nice. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. There you go. Kind of, kind of. You might think of it like: uh, How many of you have ever had an old leather glove? Anybody have an old leather glove? And by an old leather glove, I mean one that you haven't used in a long time. And it gets really hard. Gets really hard. Can you use it? No. No. You have to make it weak first. In order for you to use it, you have to make it weak. Maybe you soak it in water for a while, and it gets, it gets soft again. Because as long as it's strong, as long as it's hard, you can't use it. Well, God wants to use us. As long as I think I am sufficient, God can't use me. But as long as I am weak, then God can do with me what he wants to do, just like you can stick your hand in that glove and you can use the glove for whatever you need. And, and therefore, people, are, people know that it's not the glove that's doing it, it's you that's moving the glove, right? Uh, you know, one of the ways to think about this is, when Paul was stoned, remember when Paul was stoned, when they stoned him? And the disciples were around him because they looked at him and they said, what were they thinking? He's dead. He's dead. I mean, who can take a beating like that? Who can take a beating like that and live? Nobody. Well, then how come he lived? How come he got up? How come he, he got up the very same hour and, and was able to walk into the city? Because God gave him the power to do that. That's why. But he had to be weak before people could see that. See, we like to be strong and we like to think we win the arguments. We're smart. We're the ones who get everything right. We're the ones, we're the ones who do it. God says, no, you don't do nothing. I do everything. You, I just need somebody I can work through. Yes. Right, exactly. But when you're strong, you think there's no improvement going to be made to you. That's exactly right. Yep. No uh, yep, that's, that's right. Okay. And, and, and so God is, able to get, God is able to do that. He's able to work through people who are willing to be weak. And that's why Paul says, well, in that case, I'll boast in my weaknesses. Let me tell you how weak I am so that you can see what God's been doing in me. Okay. It, it's it's kind of it's like the, 
the guy that was hooked on drugs and you knew he was hooked on drugs for years and all of a sudden you see him at church one day and he's sober and clean and you go, how'd you do that? And he says, God did it for me. I don't know if you remember Mike Militano, but M Mike Militano, you know, attended with us for a long time. And uh, I remember one day talk talking with him uh, about, uh, I, I, if I remember right, I, I, I think it was uh, smoking that he talked about. He said he wanted to quit, but he smoked for most of his life. And so he prayed to God and says, God, you know, help me to quit. And he said the very next day, he never had an urge anymore. Never. Of course, that was God, yes. Absolutely. Right. I was told all bad language while I was in there. Right. And all of a sudden, one day, I just didn't want to use it no more. Right. Yep. yep. And, 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 and so that's what this is talking about when it talks about so that Christ may dwell in him, so that Christ may rule in him, Christ can control him. That's what, that's what he's talking about there. And if Christ wants him to be stoned and, and Christ to uh, give him life again, then Christ, then Christ can do that. Mm -hmm. But if Paul refuses to be stoned, if he says, oh, no, they're coming after me with rocks, okay, I lied. Don't, you know, don't hurt me. I'll be a Jew. Or, you know, or I'll follow the Jewish customs. Then he's being strong and God can't use him. Yeah. All right. So hopefully that helps a little bit on that. Yeah. All right. Where are we at now here? We are at uh, Romans 8 and verse 9 this time. Oh, I already covered that one. Sorry, I put it in there twice. Uh, in there it says the Father dwells in us, same thing. Revelation 21.3, we kind of looked at. Let's go back and look at it again. Uh, Revelation 21 and verse 3. Remember, this is talking about the, uh, the, the perfected church. And, and Revelation 21.3 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is, is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. So he's, he's, God is among them, but he's controlling them. He, he's the one who's, who is, who is influence, influencing them, and that's the reason they're part of God's uh, perfected community, because they're being led by God, and so that's indicated by he's their God, and they're his people. The reason God destroyed Israel, the 10 northern tribes, was because they weren't being his people. That's why. They weren't being his people. So he destroyed them. Same thing with, with Judah, southern tribes. He destroyed them because they weren't being his people. And then in 70 AD, he destroyed the Jewish community, religious community, because they weren't being his people. And he turned over the kingdom to the Gentiles. And if the Gentiles don't let God rule them, He's going to do away with them as well. All right. Um, all right. Now it says uh, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Uh, uh, the whole, uh, sorry, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us is closely connected with Christians being the temple of God. And so we kind of looked at that already, but let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. And let's notice that in Ephesians chapter 2, here's what he says about being God's temple. He says in verse uh, 21 and 22, after he talks about Jews and Gentiles being in the, in the same family or in the same rule, he says in verse 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So, how does God dwell in his temple? In the spirit. If you do what the spirit says, then you are being controlled by, by God or by Jesus or by the Holy Spirit, either one of them. Okay, And so God's going to rule or dwell in us uh, uh, according to the spirit. Uh, that's how he's going to do it. Now, we understand that Christians make up God's temple today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Yeah, these are new. If you don't have these verses, just write them down. This comes under the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, closely connected with uh, Christians being the temple of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 says, 
Uh, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. So God's temple is supposed to be what? Holy. That's what he was contrasting over here. Now, how, how is God's temple holy? The word holy means you're set apart. How are we set apart? What makes us different than the rest of the world? And don't say God. Well, God's word, God's word makes us different. When we follow God's word, then we're going to be different from the world, and therefore we're the temple of God. If you're not following the world, I mean, if you're not following the word, then you're not in agreement with God, and therefore you wouldn't be considered his temple. You wouldn't be considered a place where you can go find God, because that's what the temple means. The temple is where you go to find God. You, you, you go find the character or the teaching or the qualities of God in the temple, in whatever temple he has. So the Christians are the temple. Now, in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse uh, 19, as he's contrasting sexual immorality with how God's people are supposed to be, he says in verse 19, well, that, actually, let's read verse 18. Well, even better than that. Let's read verse 16, 17. He says, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every, one, every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body. So, he says in verse 17, he's talking about joining yourself. If you join yourself with God, then he says you're what? One spirit with him. So if you decide to be in agreement with God, then you are one spirit with God. You are in the same spirit that God's in. And that spirit dwells in you, and you dwell in that spirit, just like God dwells in that spirit, and that spirit dwells in God. And, and he says, we then become one spirit. He says, therefore, we flee immorality. He says, the reason is verse 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? So, so this body houses inside of it the spirit, uh, our, our personal spirit, and that personal spirit is supposed to be dedicated to who? to God, and so this physical body, if we use this physical body for getting drunk and doing drugs, that's because what, what controls our physical body? What controls your physical body? You do. Your spirit controls your physical body. So if your spirit is given to God, then your body should what? Should demonstrate that in activity. My body should demonstrate that I'm following God in activity that I do by being wise, admonishing individuals, singing, thanking God, doing those kinds of activities that you and I characterize as a loving way to live. And so he says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? So why does God dwell in us? Because we're not our own. We don't own ourselves. Verse 20, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Now, we glorify God in our body or with our body, but our spirit is inside of it, and our spirit is who is being ruled and controlled by God. And if your spirit is being controlled by God, then your body should demonstrate it in proper activity. You shouldn't go around murdering people if the spirit of, of God is dwelling in you. That's why, that's why Jesus told the Jews, if you were Abraham's children, you wouldn't be trying to kill me. If you had the spirit of Abraham in you, you wouldn't be trying to kill me. That's not the right spirit. Okay? All right. So, we certainly can see that the, the, the Christian is the temple of God. And the... the uh, Spirit rules or controls it. But let's take a look at where, where this concept kind of first started. And that is over here in 1 Corinthians, sorry, 1 Kings 
chapter 8. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, you have Solomon getting ready to build this, this ark, okay? And, and they're, they're getting it, I'm sorry, not the ark, but the, the, the temple, and they're bringing the ark into it along with all of the, all of the items of the um, um, temple or the, or the tabernacle. They're now going to put them inside the temple, okay? Uh, and so they, they set it all up and they get it all ready. And then Mo, um, Solomon begins to bless it. He begins to bless it in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 12. He said, then Solomon said, the Lord has said that he will dwell in, a, in the thick cloud. Now, uh, here, here's another idea. Does God actually live inside a dark cloud? Well, no, because the Bible says that God is all light. So he's not speaking physically. He's speaking relationally. He says, I have surely built you a lovely house, a lofty house, a place for your dwelling forever. Then the king faced about and blessed all the assembly of Israel. And while all the assembly of Israel was standing, he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who spoke with, my, with, with his mouth uh, to, to my father David and has fulfilled it uh, with his hand, saying, Since the day that I brought my people Israel from the land of Egypt, I did not choose a city uh, uh, I did not choose a city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house that my uh, name might be there, but I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in David's heart, and well, I'm not going to read all this to you, but I want you to come down here to verse uh, 22. It says, Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands towards heaven. By the way, you notice he spread out his hands towards heaven? Uh, he must not be a Christian because, look, he spread out his hands towards heaven. 23. He said, O Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenants and showing loving kindness to your servants who walk before you with all their hearts, who have kept uh, uh, with your servant, my father David, that which you have promised, indeed, you have spoken uh, with your mouth and have fulfilled uh, fulfilled it with your hand that uh, as it is this day now therefore o lord the god of israel keep with your servant david my father that which you have promised him saying you shall not lack a man to sit on the throne of israel uh, if only your sons take heed to their way to walk before me as you have walked now therefore o god of Israel, let your word, I pray, be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heavens and the highest heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house, which I have built. So when Solomon built the temple, did Solomon really think that God was going to actually live in it? geographically, that he was going to leave where he's at, in wherever he lives, and he's going to come down and live in that little box? No. Is that what Solomon thought? No. 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 Why do we think that? Why do we think that God's going to come down and live in this little box, this little fleshly box we have down here? Okay, good. He says, but indeed, will, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and heavens cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. Yet have regard to the prayers of your servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to listen to the cry and to pray with your, and, to, uh, and the prayer which your servant prays before you today, that your eyes may be open towards this house night and day, towards the place of which you have said, my name shall be there, to listen to the prayer which your servants shall pray towards this place. So, so Solomon says, Lord, listen to this, to the prayer of this, of, uh, when people pray to this place, because your name is here. So God's temple is where what's at? His name is at. Who's supposed to be in you? The name of Jesus. Well, if the, if the name of God is in you, but you're acting like the idols, 
then God is not in you. Right? Okay. But if you're listening to God, then God says, I'll listen to you. I'll hear your prayers. By the way, when can my wife hear my requests and my desires? When, when she's listening and she's near me or she's with me. If she's not with me, I, you know, I, I can say, Katie, I want tacos tonight. I don't know. She's not here to listen. So, <laughs> so, so, in order for her to listen, she has to be present or when I talk to her. That's what this is talking about. That's the idea of God dwelling and ruling. He listens to when you speak. If God's name is in you, if God's name isn't in you, then you're living with the devil. Yes. <laughs> well, that's true. Not only do they have to be physically present, they have to be mentally present, right? And, and, and God and Solomon is talking here about the fact that this temple isn't where God's going to live in it, but it's God's going to pay attention to it. Why? Because he lives among it. He, he, he lives there, so he's going to be concerned about it, okay? Now, like somebody said, if I call Katie on the phone, and she's at work, and I call her and I say, Katie, can we have tacos tonight? And, and if she's, you know, if she cares about me, uh, she'll say, okay, we can have tacos tonight. And when I get home, we'll have tacos. She was far away from me, but she heard me because I called her and told her because she actually living with me, even though she might be at work when I call her. <laughs> Present right. And with us. If we're not, like you just said, sometimes you're, people aren't present with you. They might be in the same room. Right. But they're not present. God is always present. That's right. He's always God, God listens to his people. He doesn't always listen to the people who aren't his people. He listens to his people. And that's the idea of being his temple. That's what, that's what he's talking about in here when he talks about this. Uh, I'm not going to read all this, but verse 27 again says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heavens cannot contain you, how much less this house uh, which you have built. Uh, and if you go, if you go to uh, 2 Chronicles, which is um, a, a re repeat of, of what we're looking at here, and you go to chapter, uh, well, let's go to 2 and verse 6 first. Now, this isn't on your paper, I don't think. Second Chronicles chapter 2, verse 6 says, But who is able to build a house for him? For the heavens and the highest heaven cannot contain him. So who am I that I should build a house for him except to burn incense before him? Now, the idea of burning incense before him is the idea of prayers. We request prayers. He hears our prayers. Uh, he doesn't actually live here. He doesn't live in that house, but he hears the prayers of that house. Right? That, that, that's, what he's, that's what he's listening to. He's listening to us pray to him. Chapter 6, the same, cha same book, and down here at verse 18. He says, But will God indeed dwell with mankind on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant, and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to listen to the cry and the prayer which, you, which your servant prays before you, that your eyes may be open towards this house day and night, towards the place of which you have said that you would uh, put your, your name there, to listen to the prayer which your servant shall pray towards this place. And so basically the idea of the temple is God pays attention to it, God listens to it, God, God gives his attention to it, and that's the idea of us being his temple. So God dwells with us like Katie dwells with me. She's not inside of me, she's not physically inside of me, but she dwells with me, and she listens to me, and, and, and she, she does what's best for me because she dwells with me. And that's the same thing that you have here with the tabernacle or with the temple that we need to, uh, that we need to think about 
and we need to consider. Now, I have a little bit more I want to tell you on this before our class is over, but we'll cover that next week. So we'll start here, kind of in this section uh, where we're at. And I will remind you of it next week because some of these verses you don't have in your paper, but you will now put them in. Any questions? And again, remember, you don't have to agree with me. I'm just simply telling you what I think the Bible teaches, and then you can study it and figure it out on your own. Drive careful, Nedra. All right, let's, let's have ourselves a prayer and we'll be dismissed. Okay, hope it goes well. Father in heaven, we praise you and we thank you for every good, perfect gift. We thank you, Father, that, that though you are greater than us, that we cannot contain you geographically, Father, but that you do rule over us, you do dwell among us, you do listen to our prayers, you listen to our supplications, you listen to our cries, and you do what's best for us and what glorifies you. And so we pray, Father, that as we have been thinking about your Holy Spirit, that you help us to understand that it's through your Spirit, Father, that you dwell among us and that you hear our supplications and that you care for us. So we pray that your spirit would continually be doing the work of your spirit among us so that we might be your people and you might hear us. We ask that you would forgive us for the times that we don't let you rule in our life. And we pray that you help us always to allow you to dwell in us. We praise you, Father, and we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.